Good start. We're on? All right. Well, welcome on into theology class, formerly known as theology and apologetics class. And what a beautiful truncation of a name, just a theology class. Don't you guys like that a lot more? You do. Yes. You're welcome. Uh, yeah, Matt is not here. He is visiting his eldest daughter who just got married to Derek a few months ago. They're up in Lake Tahoe, so they're going to be there for about six months. I think they have like four months left, five months left. And then they're going down to Tijuana to go to something called Radius, where they'll be equipped to be sent out as missionaries into the field, and their desire is to go somewhere where the gospel has never been proclaimed and bring the gospel to those people. And I just think of how backwards that is to the world. Usually you'd start from TJ with the goal of living in Tahoe, and they're going from Tahoe to TJ. So that's a nice track. Uh, but uh, Pastor Brett, one of six elders here, and I'll be talking tonight about a man that is near and dear to my heart named William Tyndale. Who's ever heard of William Tyndale? Yeah, no, ooh, a lot of hands. Good. Well, you'll probably learn some new information. Um, but, uh, oh yeah, there's a game night tonight. Uh, or no, game night Friday night. Let's just cancel this. Start playing board games. <laughs> this would be the best. <laughs> yeah, game night. Like, I love when Brett teaches. We just get out Scrabble. Uh, game night Friday at 6 p.m. Who's going to game night? Wow. Yeah, less hands than who knows Tyndale. Uh, that's good. Did I see you at Target yesterday? I thought I did. I was just had to. This will be on the live stream. That's fine. Okay. I thought I saw you walking out. I waved and then no one waved back and I was like, I don't think that's right. That's <laughs> I was like, I'm an easy guy to recognize. I think she'd know who I am. Uh, well, let me open with a word of prayer. I have a lot to get through. I could talk about this man for the next three days and somehow I have to get it into an hour. So uh, let me pray and then I'll begin. Uh, Father, we thank you so much that we have a Bible that we can read, understand, hold in our hands, open in public, unashamedly, that there is no right now cost for imprisonment or death. And that is because men throughout history have spilled their blood to get it to us. This book is written in ink and paper, but it is truly given to us by the blood of martyrs. And so tonight as we go through one of those martyrs, I pray that you would enliven in us the desire to read the word, um, to love the word, and by that you would continue to change us and sanctify us through the word. May you bring me low and may Christ be magnified. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Before we begin, you'll notice I'm not using televisions or anything like the matter. Because when we go into the new building, there's no TVs. And so for those of you who have been following along with Matt as he highlights 90% of a book, <laughs> you're like, what are the main points? All of it! Uh, and he's always like, you always make fun of me every time you teach. I was like, that's, a, that's just a reality. But uh, so there won't be any TVs. So come prepared. If you need the book when we move there, buy it or just follow along with Matt. But there's no TVs, no screens. We're just a lot of paper. Even the songs on Sunday, today I was talking with Pastor Paul, you'll get like a piece of paper every single week that has the hymns on it. You'll get an insert that we'll call the bulletin. And so for now, uh, Steve Lawson, he calls the preacher a naked man. Just that you're just up here bare and all you have is the word of God. And so that's kind of the desire, moving into the new place uh, for Tuesday nights, for theology class, as well as for preaching on Sunday mornings, that it would just be a pulpit. And the new pulpit's awesome. We're getting rid of like the rickety uh, evangelical pulpit and getting something way more robust. Like It's like this size. It's very cool. I'm excited to stand and preach from it. Uh, and so tonight, that's why I don't have, I would love to show you pictures of Tyndale and what his Bible looked like and all that, but I just, I like the mystery too. You'll just have to use your imagination. Before we begin, there's two books. Uh, last time I taught, I taught on social media, and if you want to go check that out, it's somewhere up on the app from like four or five months ago. And I always want to commend to you all good books. Um, I'm not, I haven't like done my own, Tind I'm not a Tyndale scholar, but I have read almost everything on the planet that there is about him and a lot of the reformers as well. So I'll give you the cream of the crop and where most of this information is coming from is these two books. One of them, the first one, is a little more of a, a slog, a tome. It's 440 pages. For Bryant, that's nothing. He read a book about wizards that's like a thousand pages long yesterday. And so, <laughs> it's just, that's true. Two books. The first one is by a guy named David Daniel. And so, yes, he's got two first names. Uh, it's called William Tyndale, A Biography. William Tyndale, A Biography 
by David Daniel, I think is actually how you pronounce his name, but I'm giving them the Daniel just to make it a little better. William Tyndale, a biography, that's about 440 pages. The second one is by Pastor Dr. Stephen J. Lawson called The Daring Mission of William Tyndale. The Daring Mission of William Tyndale. It's about 200 pages. It's one of the most encouraging books I've ever read. It's in a series that he has called A Long Line of Godly Men. And I was introduced to this series about 10 years ago at a Shepherds Conference. And this was the, Tyndale looks kind of the first book that he brought out and my brain exploded. I was just shocked. He, he, he gave about a half hour you know, presentation that was just like, hey, go buy the book. Uh, and I was floored that I'd never heard of this guy, that I didn't know his life, that I didn't know, you know the, the travels that he did, the work that he did, that most of my life was already influenced by him even though I didn't know his name. And so he starts there and he works through all the reformers, all the Puritans, and it's called A Long Line of Godly Men. So to that end, for Tuesday nights, being like the one-off preacher, Tuesday nights are a difficult thing. Sunday's easier because you just pick a scripture. But on Tuesday nights, you're like, what do I bring the people? Like, what, are, what do they need? What are we looking for in the church? It's ever the conundrum for like myself, Paul, uh, Trace, Jeremy, and Scott. And so I'm just going to walk you guys through most of these reformers and Puritans, Lord willing, over the next like four years. And to expose you to the men, again, who have been martyred for the faith that we hold so dearly. And the goal being, you will then respect the baton even more and desire to pass it on to the next generation. Or if it comes to the point where we will be martyred or sent to prison, uh, one, it will probably be Matt first. And so I see a Matt. Uh, <laughs> but also for us to be encouraged. I, I love biography, I love reading about it. It encouraged me to know that the same spirit that's in these men is in me. So they have no special sauce that I don't. They have the scripture and the spirit and the church. And that's what we all get. And so I just see it and see confidence knowing that if that guy can do it, I can for sure do it. He doesn't have some secret tool, some mystic Gnostic idea. He has the same tools that I have. You all, the fellowship, scripture, and the Holy Spirit. So again, a long line of godly men. I'm going to start with Tyndale. I may go to, um, I'll probably do Spurgeon next, and then Edwards and Luther and Calvin, and just work through the whole bit, and I don't know how long it'll take. So my desire is to preach through all the Psalms. I think you're all aware of that, and that, that's the only thing I preach. <laughs> um, and then also get through this series of books for Tuesday night. So uh, with that in mind, I'll start off uh, with William Tyndale. Lord willing, you're benefited by tonight, and I'll try to keep an eye on the clock. But ultimately, I'll be honest, I don't care. You're going to sit through this. <laughs> uh, three titles set William Tyndale apart. Three titles that... Uh, I would give this man, and, and history has given this man, and the first one is that he's the father of the English Reformation. The father of the English Reformation. The Reformation, if you're unfamiliar with the term, or you heard the term and you're like, I'm just too nervous to ask what it is. Uh, the Reformation was a return of the true gospel of Scripture to the people and breaking off from the Catholic Church. It started to try to reform the Catholic Church. So everyone's like, Luther tried to attack the Catholic Church. No, he nailed the 95 Theses to the church door at Wittenberg as a, as a reform to what the Catholic Church was doing. He's like, you guys need correction, and this is what I'm getting. Reading the Greek and the Hebrew and saying, this is how the church needs reform. And they're like, we don't want that. And so it started with Luther in Germany, and then it goes to Calvin and Zwingli. And Calvin was in France and in Switzerland, and Zwingli was in Switzerland. And then it hops the pond. Uh, to William Tyndale in England. And so these guys are all contemporaries of one another. So when you think through Calvin and Zwingli and Luther, Tyndale is just there. He's born like the late 1400s and early 1500s is where he did a lot of his work. And so the Reformation, as we know it, is sola scriptura, sola fide, sola gratia, solus Christus, and sola dea gloria. In other words, by the authority of the scriptures, we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone to the glory of God alone. That is the essence of the Reformation, the five solas, and these are things that we hold very dear and are willing to die for now. And that was because when, they, when Luther returned the authority of the scripture, that's just what comes out of the scripture. He's not like, I found this secret thing in here. He's like, I just went back to the Bible, to the original text, and this is what it says. And so again, he's the father of the English Reformation. Secondly, he's the father of the English Bible. And we're gonna get, in, most of that's gonna come out tonight. He was the first person to translate from the original Greek and Hebrew, the original languages of the New Testament is Greek, Old Testament is Hebrew. He was the first one to bring that into the English language. So the Bible that you hold in your hand is just saturated with Tyndale. Se thirdly, so he's the father of the English Reformation, father of the English Bible. He's the father of the modern English language, period. 
there was no English dictionary until 1703. So until then, it's just like, you could be in like several parts of in, er, er, in India, and in, uh, in England, and everyone could be using words that you've never heard of. I was just talking to Suma, and she was, when, um, when Alem was here, and she's like, I'm from Northern India, and he's from Southern India, and like, we don't even know what each other is saying. I was like, it's kind of similar to England at the time. So there's all these words that were over, and 17, that's like 300 years ago is when they got the first dictionary. It's crazy. Tinda was coining the language as he translated the Bible. He was literally creating words and having to define those words as he went through scripture from the original languages into the English. In fact, they consider the first dictionary was actually the glossary that he wrote in his Bible. And so just, there's hundreds of words that I could go through, but here's like 12 that, they're Tyndaleisms, that's what I call them. These are words that he coined. Intercession, atonement, Passover, mercy seat, scapegoat, Fisherman, castaway, busybody, viper, nurse, Jehovah, housetop, ungodly. Those are all words that Tyndale had to define, create, and then share with the world. He also coined so many phrases in your, in your Bible today that you saw. The ESV is just like loaded with Tyndale. Most Bibles are loaded with Tyndale. And here's, a, again, I could go through a list of hundreds of these. Brother's keeper, that's Tyndale. Pillar of salt, Tyndale. Full of days, Coat of many colors from Joseph in Genesis 37. Eye for an eye in Exodus. Eat, drink, and be merry from Ecclesiastes. That's Tyndale's translation. No man can serve two masters from Matthew 6. Talking about you can either serve God or you can serve money, but you can't serve them both. The blind leading the blind. Tyndale. 30 pieces of silver. Tyndale. Cast the first stone. Tyndale. Two-edged sword. And also Alpha and Omega all the way into Revelation. David Daniel writes this in his book, the, the, the bigger one that I told you about. He said, newspaper headlines still quote Tyndale, though unknowingly, and he has reached more people than Shakespeare. That's true. Mo- most theologians or scholars, well, there's a saying, they say, without Tyndale, there is no Shakespeare. And that's true because Tyndale brought words into the language that then Shakespeare was able to use creatively to come up with his plays. And so if he didn't have the language or the, the quantity of words that existed from Tyndale, he probably wouldn't have happened. And so again, he is just saturated in our world. In 2002, the BBC named him the 26th most influential person that Britain ever produced. John Fox and Fox's book, The Martyr, is another book that you should buy. I've recommended it to you before. Just kind of goes through the panoply of martyrs, people who have died for the cause of Christianity from the death of Christ all the way to the present day. He writes this about Tyndale. He said, he was the apostle of England. J.H. Merle says he was the mighty mainspring of the Reformation. I mean, that God just crushed this guy down like a bedspring. And when God pulled his hand off, launched him out into the English countryside, getting the word of God to them. Leland Riken calls him a linguistic genius. He had two degrees from Oxford and he was fluent. And I mean fluent, reading and writing and speaking in eight languages. Jackie, you know three, right? And it's, I'm always just like, how did she do it? It's in like eight. <laughs> I can't even fathom like how his brain can function. And you see the sovereignty of God in that. Um, when I preach Psalm 139, I, I, I just think, this is kind of a tangent, so much is in our DNA that we don't even know yet. Like God has truly just designed people's mental capability, your likes, your dislikes. I know there's everyone, there's a lot of people who are on the nurture path or the nature path, but I just think God has truly designed us and knitted us together in our mother's womb to the point where we like, there's just certain things and desires that we like. And he's made people with minds that are incredible. I remember, uh, um, who does the briefing? Al Mohler, Albert Mohler. He's at Shepherd's Conference and you're like, man, I'm just such a loser. This guy's like, how does he do all this stuff? And he's like, since I was a kid, I've needed four hours of sleep. He's like, I would skip football practice to go under the bleachers and read dictionaries. And I'm like, we're different. <laughs> and so you're like, you just, you just have to like, and that's kind of the goal. God, God, as God orchestrates and designs the church, as you think through 1 Corinthians 12, that he, he, he gives spiritual gifts and organizes us so that we don't have to compete to be like one another. It's such a freeing thought. Like I have zero desire to be Matt, truly. I was like, Matt's Matt, like I'm me, God, this is how he's designed us. There's different components that all of us need that God's like, this is what the church needs. Similar with all of you. There's a spiritual gift that you have to edify the local church. And it's what a blessing that you're not like, oh, I wish I had that one. You're like, that's why Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy, like fan into flame the gift that God's given you. And so he's like, don't go seeking all these other things. Whatever you got, like work and exercise that. Brian Edwards 
calls him the heart of the Reformation. Then he wrote a follow-up book to that where he said Tyndale was the Reformation in England. So why study this man? Outside of Christ, he's probably had more influence in your life than any person you know. Truly. And his life story, it's an inspiration for us to value the book that we have in your hands. Again, this is a blood-bought book. From the blood of Christ through the blood of the martyrs to your hands. And so as we sit in this time period where God has granted us such an ease of, of volume of Bibles that we can have, I literally, have, just from my phone and my iPad, I have th- three Bibles up here. Literally with Logos, I have like every Bible you could ever think of. But when we realize the cost of it, it makes us cherish it more. So right now, we're just like, it's just the world's just saturated with Bibles. There's 40 million translations. And so you can just be prone to be apathetic towards it. And so we know it's the word of God. That should be enough for us to be like, let's open it, because God wrote a book. That's crazy. <laughs> but then when you see the, the, the sacrifice that has been poured over this to get this into your hands, and the fact that we can read it in English is nothing short of miraculous. And I'm going to get into that, because as you look at England during the time of Tyndale, it was pretty dark. So I'm going to go through some context. That was the loudest drink ever. I'm going to go... <laughs> When things are awkward, you just got to call them out. So I'll give you the context of kind of where Tyndale was and then what he was battling against. And like I said, it was extremely dark time in England. The Catholic Church was the highest power in the land. They preached from the Latin Vulgate. The Vulgate had been updated in about a thousand years, and it was written in Latin. And so people, like, we take it for granted that Matt's preaching from a Bible, I'm preaching, Paul's preaching, and you're like, Oh, yeah, I commend to you, our sister. That's what he's saying. He's saying the words that I'm looking at. Back then, you didn't know. The Pope could, they could just say anything they wanted to. In fact, uh, the scholars would say, of the 20,000 priests in England at that time, only 10% could read Latin. That's their book. And so that's, you understand how nestled this was in the power of the church, the power of the papacy and the papal bulls that existed. That's what they cared about. It was just tradition, tradition, tradition. No one wanted to go back to the scripture. The, the Pope had all the authority. The scripture did not have the authority. Priests had authority. Bishops had authority. And there was this Gnostic view of them that there's this secret knowledge that only they could attain. And you could go to them with indulgences and they could release your, your fellow sibling from, from purgatory, which is crazy. So the grip and the hold and the darkness that laid upon England was not even close to anything we've seen in our lifetime. Again, it was about power and control, and they understood very, very acutely that the number one way that they would lose power is if people actually got this book. Because then they'd open it up and be like, that's not what you're saying. It looks different. So against people reading the Bible and understanding it in their own language, in 1401, legislation was passed. You can fact check everything that I'm going to say. In fact, I encourage you to. I was like, I would love to debate 1500s Catholicism. <laughs> no one will. Um, in 1401, legislation was passed by Parliament called the Burning of Heretics. This is real. You would be burned at the stake for possessing a Bible in English. In England. If you were found teaching in English, you would be burned at the stake. In 1408, the Archbishop of Canterbury said, it's a dangerous thing to translate the Holy Scripture out of one tongue and into another, which is that just, I mean, I'm not going to get into COVID and gaslighting, but you're like, but that's what you did. You took it from the Greek and Hebrew and put it into Latin. And then as soon as you did that, you're like, no one else could do that. You're like, well, what, that's all, <laughs> great. What power and authority that they have. You're like, you make the rules. That's what a blessing. And so they kind of put a cap on it. They also said, we, degree, we decree and ordain that no man hereafter translate any text into English. No man can read it in part or in whole. And if you think they are kidding, I could could tell stories for days, but the one that grips me the most, but in in the late 1300s, there's a guy named John Wycliffe, and he, because everyone's like, oh, I thought Wycliffe translated English. Yes, but he was translating out of the Vulgate, and he didn't have a printing press, and so he was just handwriting the Bible, and it would take about six months for another Bible to be produced. So he'd handwrite the whole thing, and then like six months later, he'd have another, he's like, here's two copies in a year. And Tyndale, just like, you know, Gutenberg, one of the greatest, probably the greatest invention ever in history, bar the internet, that was allowed to know to create as many copies as he wanted to. So late 1300s, John Wycliffe has his Bible, and there's a, a kind of a sect within Catholicism that 
was sympathetic to the, the cause of getting the Bible into English, and they were called lollards. Another way you could say it is like they were murmurers. And so that if you're walking around speaking the scripture in English, you're going to get tied to a stake. And so they were called lollards, murmurers, because they would walk around like repeating under their breath the scripture so they could memorize it in their own tongue. It's pretty awesome. And so the Catholic Church hears about this. They're obviously upset. Um, and they bring in seven of these priests of the lollards. And they bring in their children. And they ask their children to recite the Lord's Prayer. And one of the daughters goes, starts reciting it. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And the priest goes, all seven of you come here. And he burns them at the stake for teaching their kids the Bible in English. That is darkness. And I hate to motivate by guilt, but for the fathers in here, like we have a time where you can teach your kid anything you want, which is crazy. And so if they were doing it back then, willing to die for it, how much more should we? But just as the depravity of man is the black velvet backdrop on which the diamond of the gospel shines the brightest, so too does the black darkness in the Catholic hold of England represent the black backdrop of the light of Tyndale finally catching that spark. Because when he gets lit up, that dark room, you start to see everything. You can see all the walls, the blemishes, the people, the power, all that exists. And so that is the background in the condition in which William Tyndale set out to translate the Bible into English. He was born in 1498 in Gloucestershire. His family were landowners, they were farmers, they had some means and resources at the time, and pretty early on they realized that their son was, you know, like a linguistic genius. <laughs> you can kind of tell, Carrie hates when I make this joke, but I'm like, I'm just like, I'm going for plumber with River. I'm like, you're gonna do it. I was like, but they make like $400 an hour. I'm like, so I was like, now it's not the worst thing in the world. But I was like, you kind of tell. Like, he's like an amped up kid. I just can't see him at a desk like studying books. Um, but Tyndale, like they saw that. They're like, this, he just wants to read. It's like, as I talk about Al Mohler, I'm like, okay, that family, they didn't curtail him into football because he's like skipping out to read books. So Tyndale was no different. A parent has a good gauge on their kid and what they're good at, what they're not good at. And so they put him into Oxford. And that, that sounds like, you know, a lot of times you're like, they were in college at 10. Oxford, there was like a preparatory school. And so I always think of like the English soccer teams, like you're like, you're like Arsenal. Like you, you, you get on Arsenal when you're like seven and then they just grow you. Like kids in America, these just don't stand a chance. <laughs> like these European kids are like, I played for Manchester United since I was seven and they just grow you up in the program. And so Oxford and Cambridge at the time were very similar. So at age 12, he goes into this preparatory school and for 10 years he locks in. So he, around 22 is when he gets out. But Oxford at the time, was so ran by the Catholic Church and so autocratic that they had just a crazy amount of rules. It was basically a humanist institution. So you learn like secular humanism kind of guised with this like overarching view of Catholicism. And you couldn't get a Bible in your hand until you had been there eight years. So that was like a rule that they had set in place. And it was the Vulgate. And it was the original languages that you could finally get. Because, I mean, Erasmus had made it, uh, I have to leave all that up for time's sake. But <laughs> Tyndale... So he's there, and it's, that's no different from our college. Like, why would they wait that long? Because they have you fully indoctrinated. After eight years, like, you don't want the Bible. You want what the Pope says. It's the same, like, I mean, I went to, <laughs> I came out of college, and guess what? I was a secular humanist who loved socialism. Like, welcome to planet Earth. Every, let's like every, <laughs> every, every public system, this is what they want. All, every public college is just pumping you with secular humanism and socialism. Anyone else come out a socialist and a secular humanist? Yeah, all right. Perfect. <laughs> Good company. That's, I mean, that's what they're, and you can't, like, you can't blame them. You're like, you're ran by the government, so that makes total sense. <laughs> like, um, anyway, call, won't go off on that diatribe. So anyway, he, he sees this, and as he, as he starts to learn, he's like, man, I, I want the scripture. So he leaves Oxford, goes to Cambridge, which, again, that's, you've heard of these schools before. He was not a dummy. So he goes to Cambridge in 1516, and another thing you've probably heard of, there's a small group Bible study that's meeting at this place called the White Horse Inn. Who's heard of the White Horse Inn? Yeah. Right now, it's just like Facebook pages with guys with beards who are like, I'm drinking an IPA and learning the Bible. It's like so weird. Um, and so 
You know, <laughs> see, people know what I'm talking about. Uh, so then they're, they're together at this White Horse Inn. And Luther, he's in Germany, and his, his, like, his ideas and his, his translations start to float across the pond. And where are they going? They're going to high academia. And so these ideas start getting discussed. Reformation thinking and Reformation uh, uh, exegesis starts to come into Cambridge at the time. And these guys at the White Horse Inn, that's what they discussed. And in God's sovereignty, I always think of like, if you're like, oh, what Bible study were you in 40 years ago? Oh, it was uh, me and R.C. Sproul and John MacArthur and John Piper. And you're like, what? <laughs> I was like, that was your Bible study? That's crazy. And so this one was no different. Of the 20 or so guys, nine of them became martyrs. The greatest preacher of the English Reformation, Hugh Latimer, was at this study. The greatest theologian, Nicholas Ridley. And arguably, and from where I stand, the greatest architect of the English Reformation, Thomas Cranmer, all came out of the White Horse Inn, including Tyndale. So God sovereignly putting these men together to bounce ideas off of one another is just mind-blowing. And it was during this time in this small group Bible study, and some of you have this exact same testimony. You're like, I was at a church. It wasn't good. I was in this Bible study, though, or I, I, had, a, I had a youth pastor who took me aside. Tyndale finally gets saved. So he gets saved at Cambridge from discussing the scriptures and looking at the original language. And when he got saved, he echoed exactly what Luther said. He said, the whole Bible changed. Because when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it illuminates the word to you. So he knew, like he had scripture memorized forward and back. It's like like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. What did Christ say? Have you not read? Which is insulting. Like, yeah, we have read. And so he knew it all, but he didn't know how to, where it sat. He didn't know the the, the root of it all. He's like, it wasn't Christ-centered. It was was church-centered. And so he gets saved. The word illuminates to him. And he's like, I have to go somewhere alone and unlearn everything that I've ever learned. And to me, I always compare this. I'm older, I have glasses. I'm wearing contacts now. But when you get, like, the worldview is a lens that you see the world through. So it's an easy picture. Like, if you have an old prescription of glasses and then you get new glasses and you put them on, you're like, oh, everything's sharp and bright. But you're also like a little like this for a little bit. And you get a headache and things are, <laughs> well, Will just got LASIK. He was like, good to see you. I was like, good to blur you. Um, and so, <laughs> yeah, the, it's, it's sort of like Tyndale puts on these new glasses and he's like, I got to go like sit a little bit until I can see things clearly and understand actually what, what I have now, how does that look like walked out in the world? And so he goes back to Gloucestershire where he was born and he meets this guy named Sir John Walsh and he gets a job with him and Sir John Walsh has a big estate and he becomes the tutor to their kids. He becomes like their, their personal pastor and this is super common. You're always like, how did Edwards or how did Owen write all these books? And you're like, well, like billionaires took them in and they were like their private teachers and you're like, teach us for an hour and then just go over there and like read and write stuff and I'll give you whatever you need. It's amazing. I, I joked with Matt, I was reading this biography on, on Owen lately, and I was like, mortification of sin. I'm like, that guy had it made. And I was like, he wrote that book just like totally hooked up. Um, and so yeah, that, that was just the comment. So I asked him, I'm like, would you do that if a billionaire came? Would you leave the church? So he's like, ah. I was like, you totally would. <laughs> so, that'd be tough. I probably would do. I was like, oh yeah, if I could still preach and teach. Um, so he gets this job at his biggest estate. He's kind of the personal chaplain, personal tutor, but it gives him time to sit in his study. And he studied intensely. And one night as he sat there and he's going through reformed thinking, he's, he's seeing the Bible come to life. He realized that every single person in England is damned to hell. And so when you get saved, you're like, man, that means that like my uncle is going to hell. That means that like, my dad's going to hell. My brother's going to hell. Amplify that by a million fold. The, there was, with the, the, the helm of the Catholic Church in England, there was no, there's no gospel. It, it was, at the time, going into England was like going to like a hut in like the middle of the Philippines. It was no different. They had a false gospel, but that was the only gospel they had. And so Tyndale is sitting there, and the two things that happen to you when you get saved, and you realize, man, all my relatives like are damned, you sit in sadness, and then you do a lot of like, why me, God? And that's the beauty of grace. But then the fire gets lit in you, and you're like, I gotta go tell these people what I know. And the same thing happened to Tyndale. So he sits in sadness, and then realize, oh, I need to go wake up the world. I need to go wake up England with the truth of the gospel. And he knew no other way to do that than to get a Bible into everyone's hands. And so he's like, that's the easiest distribution system. He's like, if they just get it and read it, they can read the Romans road. They can understand saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. 
And so that's what he did. And so he would sit and study and he would kind of preach randomly and two texts that stood out to him were Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 14, how are they to hear without someone preaching? Like we even take that text for granted because he, he reads that, he's like, how are they here without someone preaching? And implied in that is they actually understand the language of the preacher. So what a weird implication from that text that he got to like, we're never, like, we're never gonna think that implication because we're like, oh yeah, preaching. You just assume the same language, you assume everything. But Tino's like, he's like, we have preachers, but they might as well be speaking Swahili. So as he's sitting there one night at the time, Sir John Walsh, they didn't have television. And so these wealthy people would basically like accrue like weird friends and just different ideas and they'd put them together and they'd eat a meal. We're like, uh, you guys talk. And then they just eat. And so one night he invites a priest over because he's, he's been hearing Tyndale and Tony's always been giving him, hey, like, you know, I think the Catholic Church got it all wrong as I look at the original languages, like this whole thing's a farce. And so John Walsh is like, I'm gonna bring a priest over, <laughs> let you guys duke it out while I, you know, sip a Pepsi. And so a priest comes over and, Tyndale speaking and the priest getting fired up. And when I had a debate breaks out, and this is the famous, I'm sure if you know of Tyndale, this is the famous conversation. The priest says this, we would rather have what the Pope has to say than what the law of God has to say. Tyndale replied, I defy the Pope and his laws. If God spare my life many years, I will cause a boy that drives the plow to know more of scripture than the Pope in Rome. And that was the match strike. That was, I mean, I, I would have loved, to, you're like, would you have, what time period? I'm like, I would have loved him at that table. Just to see just the fire lighting in this man. He's like, God is designing me and all my translative power in these eight languages that I've accrued in his sovereignty where I can actually go out and do this. And so he did. And he tried to do it like Luther the right way. And so he's like, I, I want to translate into English. And so he's like, my first step is I got to go to London and I got to meet with the Bishop of London to see if he's going to approve this. Because if he did it without approval, he's going to get burned at the stake. And I'm sure in his thinking, he's like, this is no way they're going to allow this. And he was right. So he goes to the bishop. He's immediately rejected. And to this day, it's said that the, the bishop used the excuse uh, in Germany when Luther came with Reformation and with uh, a restoration of authority of Scripture over the Pope, they had something called the Peasants' Revolt, which just makes total sense. Because <laughs> if you're like, hey, here's this Bible, and then everyone starts reading it, and you're like, you've been lying to me. You've been lying to my parents, to my grandparents, to my kids, to my entire extended family, and they lose their minds, justifiably so. And so then in London, they're like, ah, oh, we don't want another revolt. Again, the, 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 the pressure and the oppression to stifle the word of God into the people's hands, I, I, cannot, I cannot make this a bigger picture for you. It was astronomical. And so coming back from that, he's a little upset and you know, disturbed. He's like, well, I'm still gonna figure this out. And a wealthy businessman, another wealthy businessman, Tyndale's life is kind of saturated with him, hears him preaching, and he says, whatever you need, I got you. And it always reminds me, something that a lot of these books don't mention, don't draw attention to, because you, you put the guy on a pedestal, that's true. You're like, Wyndham Tyndale, like, like God's missionary, God's secret warrior. But all throughout this, and what I kind of bring out, is that there's, I call them the greets. And so when you're in the scripture, you're like, Paul just has these, like, Romans is the best picture of it. Because you're like, man, here's the gospel, the Romans road. Then he goes into 9, 10, 11, like, sovereign grace and election. God's the potter. We're the clay. We got that. Then he goes in, like, submission to authorities that uh, our life is our spiritual worship. And then, like, chapter 16 is like, and greet all these people. And you're like, okay, like, this, we're here we go. And all right, Paul. And usually just, like, greet, greet, blah, 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 blah. And then you, like, go on to the next first Corinthians. Uh, it's sort of like, yeah, it's the totally dotes of the, of the Old Testament. But yeah, well, if you have your Bible, just go to Romans 16. I, it's, it's fascinating to see because we look, oh, the Apostle Paul, like he's great. And obviously everything is put, pointing forward and picturing Christ and Christ is on display. But this list of just like no-namers to me is one of the most encouraging things in all of scripture. Because if, as I look around, some of you call me Pastor Brett, and that's great, that's okay. Most of you call me Brett, and I like that. Um, but I'm not a pastor without all of you. Like when you graduate seminary, you're not like, now you're a pastor. Like you're a seminary graduate. Like a pastor requires a flock. <laughs> I was like, plain and simple. I was like that, but definitionally. And so we can sit up here and preach and teach all we want, but if all of y'all aren't actually applying and executing the scripture, like everything dies. And so you're just, everyone, that's the beauty of the church is God assembles it. Every person, every person's gift is just as essential as me standing up here right now. Truly. 
It's, it's, and it's ethetical, and obviously Tyndale saw all of that. <laughs> I won't belabor this whole thing. Um, what time is it? 7.36. It says in uh, Romans 16, I commend you our sister Phoebe, which we know a little bit about from Acts, a servant of the church at St. Crea. You may welcome her in the Lord in a way of the saints and help her in whatever she may need of you. For she has been a patron of many and of myself as well. Greet uh, Prissa and Achilla, which we learned about, my fellow workers in Christ. I love that word workers. Who risked their necks for me. Who might only give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Greet also the church in their house. And at the time, if you had a church in your house, you were probably pretty wealthy. Greet my beloved Eponidas. No idea who that guy is. Who is the first convert to Christ in Asia. When we know when Paul went there. Greet Mary, who has worked hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junia. If you're in the South Hunia. My kinsmen and my fellow prisoners. Kinsmen, fellow prisoners, people who worked hard. They are well known to the apostles. They're well known to them, but they're not well known to us. So these are like their best friends working hard. This is the businessman with Tyndale. You're like, I don't know who that guy is, but he's influential, paramount in us having the Bible. I don't even know what he sold. <laughs> like he could have been a terrible businessman. Uh, greet Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and my beloved Stachys. Greet Apelles, and I have no idea if I'm getting these names right, <clears throat> who is approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. There's an awesome name for your kid. Greet my kinsman Herodian. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. That guy must have liked himself. Greet those workers in the Lord, Tryphena and Tryphosa. Greet the beloved Persis who has worked hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, Rufio, chosen in the Lord. Also his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. I love that line. When, when I got saved, I was like 24. I was out here. I didn't know anybody. And Matt's mom, Terry, just grafted me into her family. She literally, for years, I was like, I, was like, I don't know. I'm like, Terry, that's basically the mom I got out here. And so Terry was it. So I understand like this familial language that exists in here. Greet asyncretous. Uh, that guy must have had like, you know, one slope to his head or something. <laughs> Phlegian, Hermes. Hermes is my best. I was like, this dude, this guy's named after a Greek god and he got saved. So he's like, still has the name Hermes and he's walking around. So this is just a, just a, a brooch of some of the names. As you, a lot of the, the, um, the epistles, you'll have this at the end. I just call them the Greeks. Like, here's the Greeks people. And like, these are just all names. We're like, their name is in God's word forever. And we know nothing about them. I love it says they're well known by the apostles. And all of us have that. You all have people in your lives where you're like, I'm not here without this person. Or my spiritual walk isn't here without this person. Especially at our church. We're, we're like the Jerusalem church. We're like in the city and we're broke. <laughs> but we spin out like disciples all over the planet just because, you know, people, you have a kid, two kids, too expensive, you leave. You're in the military, you're here for a few years, then you leave. You're in college, you're here for a few years, then you leave. And so we're like, send some money back. <laughs> like we're, we're doing the best we can. But it's just like this launching out of people all over the world. It's amazing that God put us here for such a time as this. And so you've impacted lives of people all over. The, when you share, when you do something, something as simple as sharing a, a sermon or that brother that you encouraged the other day who now lives somewhere else, like all that, you're in the godly line of faithful people. And so just because there's big names, recognize that there are tons of people behind those names. And Matt very much realizes that. <laughs> very much realizes that. Again, he, we're not pastors without all of you. So this Christian businessman, uh, he funds his whole journey, and he's in the long line of faithful men. At the age of 30, Tyndale realizes after he talks to the bishop, and the bishop says, there's nothing you can do, and we're not going to fund your project, and you can't translate. He leaves England, and he makes a conviction. He says, I will never marry I will never have kids. I will never own land. I will be on the run and in hiding until I get this done. He's a man on a mission. And what's even crazier is there's no elders that laid hands on him. Like I said, this businessman could have been like corrupt. Like, I, don't, I don't even know, I, no clue. There's no denomination that commissioned him, no church that sent him, no missions agency. He was like, I'm gonna go. And he left. He, he was in one sense a one man machine with all this other help along the way. And he's one man against the giant of the Catholic Church, but to use a tro uh, just a trite statement, one with God is a majority. And Tyndale's life is an example of that. So he left as an outlaw, he left as a fugitive. He left uh, a fugitive to the Catholic Church and also to King Henry VIII, which I could wish I could do hours on King Henry and his corruption, but how God used him mightily in all of this. 
So he goes to Germany. He's like, I'm going to go wherever Luther is. He goes to Wittenberg where Luther nailed the 95 Theses. And he wanted to go there and continue his English translation, but he realized he had to learn Hebrew. At the time, there's like four people in this room who know Hebrew. At the time, there was probably one person in all of England that knew Hebrew. One. I mean, it's insane. Like, if I give you Lagos, you, you could right now stumble through Hebrew just by, like, covering your finger over certain buttons. It's harder than that, but <laughs> you get the idea. I was like, what well, the tools we have now are just insane. There's one person. So he's like, I, I got to get up to Luther because at least people up there know Hebrew because at some point I'm going to have to learn Hebrew to translate the Old Testament. So he goes up there, he sharpens his Greek, sharpens his Hebrew, starts, continues writing his translation. He's there for about a year, and then he has to flee to Cologne, Germany. And the reason is he just can't sit in one spot for a long period of time. If people start to know who he is and what he's doing, and there's English people all over, there's Catholic sympathizers all over that are going to send it back to England. They're going to try to come get him. So he's always on the move. So Cologne, he goes there because it's the largest city in Germany. It's just like now if you go to a small town, like where I grew up, they're going to know your name. Like <laughs> I was joking. I'm like, Tony, I need to bring you home. Like everyone will know Tony in like five minutes. Um, and, but if you go to a big city, you blend in. Like no one can understand. Like it would take, you would never possibly know everyone in San Diego in your lifetime. No way. So he goes to Cologne, Germany, kind of fit in there. And he finds his first printer. And the printer as well is in this long line of faithful men. Yes. Is he going to make money by printing the Bible? Sure. Would he get killed if they got found out that he was trying to do that? Absolutely. So here's another man willing to put his life on the line for the sake of getting the Bible into the hands of people in England who can actually read it. So he finds a man who's willing to print his New Testament. And obviously, he's like full of joy and elated. And he's like, I finally get this thing out. And the owner of the print shop, along with some of his buddies, they go out and drinking, as you would do. And they're at a pub, not the White Horse Inn. And they start talking like, man, this guy Tyndale, he's the best. I can't believe he's doing and there's Catholic sympathizers there, and they overhear it. And so they run it up the flagpole, and like within minutes, people are storming this print shop. But by God's grace, Tyndale was suspecting that the person was overhearing it. He's like, I, I think they're going to do something. So he runs back to the print shop, gathers up everything he has, and bolts. And he gets on the Rhine River and heads over to Worms, Germany. Uh, you've heard of the Diet of Worms, where Luther was before the Roman Council, the Catholic Council, and they asked him to recant of his views, and his famous line is, my conscience is bound to the word of God. I can do no other. Here I stand. God help me. Where Luther was like, if you're going to kill me, kill me. But to me, this is worth it. What I've done here in, in, in exegeting the scriptures and bringing the authority of the word and salvation by grace alone through faith alone and Christ alone, kill me right now, but I'm not going to recant of my views. That was the Diet of Worms. And there was a lot of sympathizers in Worms for, uh, for Reformed theology. In another just act of sovereign grace, he finds another printer. Again, another guy willing to sacrifice his life. To think of the sovereignty again of God, these print shops had to have four things. The first had to be in a city on a river. Because how's he going to get them to England? He's trying to get the Bibles into Scotland and England, so it needs to be on a river. And not only that, the river has to flow into the ocean, so you kind of loop it around and get them to the islands. So it has to be a city on a river. The river has to flow into the ocean. It needs to have a pretty big forest nearby, because he's, he's wanting to, his print runs are like 3,000 copies of like 1,000 pages. And so he's like, I also need paper nearby. And I need to print shop large enough to take on the task. The Gutenberg printing press was pretty new, so it had to be like a pretty well-renowned renowned printing, pre printing shop. And so like all these four things had to, had to be an amalgam, had to, to sync up to make this happen. And in 1525, while in Worms, it happened. The Tyndale New Testament was finally printed. And the original copy uh, of the, this Bible still exists. The, the hand, there's a handwritten uh, a prologue to it, and Tyndale writes this with his own pen. We have not received the gifts of God for ourselves only, or to hide them, but for us to bestow them unto the honoring of God and Christ and edifying of the congregation, which is the body of Christ. He's like, God has given me these gifts and abilities. Who am I to hold them gnostically over everyone when I can use them to translate and bless the church? The exact opposite of what the Catholic Church was doing at the time. Lawson says this about this first work. As Tinsdale translated the Greek text into English, he did so with extraordinary ability and skill. His unique gift was translating in a matter that was personal and direct. He used the everyday words of the marketplace in order to have his work understood by the common man. Moreover, he arranged his well-chosen words in simple sentences to facilitate comprehension. He did not write for the elite in the academy, but for the man on the street. 
Tyndale wrote with the aim of bringing the truth of Scripture to the masses of common people. His style was contemporary yet majestic. His work set the standard of all English translations that would follow. And these Bibles, if you look at your phone, so there's a 1535 Bible up at, um, at when we go to Shepherd's Conference in the seminary there in a, what's the seminary, Will? Master's Seminary, thank you, Will. <laughs> <laughs> You're going there. Or Master's College. Yeah, Master's Seminary. It's about the size of your phone, and it's about that thick. And so you always think of, like, you see these, like, English Bibles, where it's like, poof, these huge things with, like, flourishes all over. But he had to smuggle them in. So, like, I, I couldn't even, the one they have there, I can't even read the time, like, doing this thing. And my eye doctor's like, good thing you got long arms. You won't need readers for a while. I'm like, thanks, jerk. Uh, <laughs> so he's like, you got that going for you. But it was tiny. It had to be smuggled. It was like jamming them into these bales of cotton and getting them up the river. So it was, a t- it was a tiny book. But again, the sovereignty of God to allow a printing press that could print small typeface. The Wycliffe Bible, like you're trying to read penmanship. I can, I can barely read my own penmanship. And so like anyone who gets a Wycliffe Bible, one, it's a rough translation, but also like you just can't tell what half of the words are. And so they had this small pocket-sized Bible. Again, just the sovereignty of God in this is unbelievable. In the Bible, when it gets to England, it starts to get bought like crazy. Businessmen, farmers, every, people are just pining for it. They want it, and you can imagine. Imagine if you didn't have a Bible and someone's like, Bibles are coming to town. You're like, oh my goodness. You'd like be shoving people out of your way. I would be anyway. <laughs> and so it causes such a raucous in England that the Bishop of London hears about it. He goes to St. Paul's Cross and preaches a sermon that's absolutely scathing. And I wish I could read the whole thing, but basically he denounces the translation saying that only a fool would buy it. And the best part is, like, then the Catholic Church goes on to try and buy them all. (laughs) And so I'm like, yeah, you're kind of right. So at the time, they're trying to buy all the Bibles so they can burn them. And at the same time, another wealthy businessman hears about this, and he's like, I'm going to buy them all. And he's like, I'll, I'll buy myself, and then I'll distribute them to, I don't know if he marked them up. Like maybe he was flipping them for profit. I don't think so. But he, he, so you have the Catholic Church trying to buy them all. This wealthy businessman trying to buy them all so he can get them into the farmers and the peasants. And the businessman also is like, hey, Tyndall, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to front load you all the cash. And so he's like, I don't need it coming in. Here, here's, here's more money than if you were to sell these and have to wait. And just keep continuing to refine this and keep making more translations. Get me an Old Testament. He wanted the t- work of Tyndale to keep going. And then word gets to the king and King Henry VIII, and you know, by this time, he, he just desired Tyndale to be stopped. Um, king, the king, uh, <laughs> that's a whole class in itself. Henry VIII was not a fan of Tyndale. Um, he had a short little backstory. Henry VIII, he was the spare, not the heir. And so his brother dies, he becomes the king, and he's married to this lady named Catherine, and she's like in her 40s and can't produce an heir, and he's all about having an heir, the idol of the heir. And so he wants to marry this other woman, Anne Boleyn, who's like 20 years old, and he's like, hey, I'm the king, so I'm going to try to go to the Catholic Church and say, like, hey, I want an annulment on my marriage so I can produce an heir. And the Catholic Church is like, no. He's like, how you dare you? I'm the king. And then eventually he splits off, and that's the creation of the Church of England, the one that still exists today, where the king is still the Archbishop of Canterbury. What is it now? Prince, king, what's the guy's name? Andrew? I have no idea. Who? Charles. There we go. Charles. My wife loves that show. Uh, what's it called? The Crown. Look at a shame on all of you. No, I don't know. It's probably good. The Crown. She's like, you got to watch this. I'm like, it's probably not real. Uh, I'm always, it's just like the Passion of the Christ where I'm like, it's amazing. But I'm like, it's a little, there's little spots where it's not the Bible. And I'm like, I can't, I lose my mind. Um, so yeah, Henry, so maybe he's like, well, I'll make my own religion. And now the Church of England, he's like, the king is the head. He's the power. He's the authority, not the Pope anymore. And so that was like the big split. It was all just him wanting to like sleep with this other woman. Crazy. Um, nothing new under the sun. <laughs> so Tyndale, finding out about this, in 1530, he writes this scathing treatise about the king. It's called The Practice of the Prelates, and the pre- basically like the practice of someone who's in authority. And this is what he writes to the guy who's already mad at him. He lambasts King Henry VIII's attempts to have his marriage to Queen Catherine annulled by the Catholic Church. Tyndale questioned the authenticity of any king's faith if it accompanied by unrepentant and habitual immorality. He also criticized church leaders throughout history for capitulating to immoral Christian emperors and kings in exchange for their own political influence and job security. I was like, he just just had a death wish. (laughs) That's crazy. So then Charles sends some spies out to find Tyndale, rightly so, and so he sends these spies out all over Europe to undertake this manhunt to find Tyndale and every kind of way that he tries fails except for the last one. 
One time they did find him, an emissary found Tyndale, and uh, the king was sort of offering these loosely handed terms of peace. And so the emissary uh, goes to him and says, hey, the king said, if you come back, if you stop your translative work and come back, he's going to hook you up with all this money. He's going to give you all this stuff. Here's land. Here's property. He'll make you like some guy to college. And Tyndale's like, yeah, cool. That works for me as long as the king replaces someone else to continue my work, which is kind of like a slight and a joke. The emissary goes back to the king, and the king just, he's just befuddled. He just cannot understand Tyndale. Like, this is a man who's just, like, continually thumbs his nose at, like, the, the king who's everyone's just bowing down to. And he said, what's Tyndale like? Like, who is this guy? And the emissary replies, he's a man who only sings one note. He has a one-track mind. He is on mission to translate the scriptures so that all of England can be saved. It's just like us. What, in 2 Timothy, when Paul refers to the work of the Christian life, what, what three traits does he use? The farmer, the athlete, the soldier. Not like the Instagram influencer, the basket weaver, and the like, data entry guy. Like, it, 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 there's a mission behind all of us to make disciples who make disciples. And in Tim Dale's case, he's like, I can't even do that until I get an actual Bible in their hands. <laughs> so he's like one step below it. He's a man who only sang one note. And Sir Thomas More of the church hierarchy, he's also just hellbound on tracking down Tyndale. So he writes a sk- like sk- six vo- this is a six volume work. I haven't read a lot of it. Half a million words trying to like defame Tyndale and renounce the work that he's doing. And just some of the quotes. He called him the hellhound of the devil's kennels. Which is just a great, like if, if you don't like someone, like that's a great, I, almost, I like that. You're, like, you're the hellhound of the devil's kennels. You're like calling him a dog chained by Satan. He said he, for trying to translate the Bible into English so that people could read it, he said he was the second coming of Judas, the heretic of heretics. But Tyndale wouldn't be stopped. He didn't care again. He's a man on a mission. And so as this New Testament is flying throughout England, and at the time, like, it wasn't cheap. A lot of these were around 3000 like a $3,000 Bible in our day. And so, like, you know, when, like when, when all of you who have, whatever, I have an RL, this Bible's like 300 bucks. You're like, that's crazy. But I'm like, not really. I was like, it's pretty cheap, comparably so. He moves on, and he's now to translate the Old Testament into English. He starts with the Pentateuch, first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and it takes him about a year. But again, he's always on the move. He, he's working, like, we have these, like, cush offices. He's, like, in, like, dimly lit back rooms, bunkers, like, at night, no one around him. There's, uh, there's, the, there's two portraits that we have of Tyndale that exist in the world, and they're only like, they probably look like that, because it was just through his friends that could describe him, because he couldn't get a portrait made, because if people found out what he looked like, that would hurt his cause. And so he's in dark rooms, bunkers, closets, alleys, candlelit, but he has to stay on the move as he writes this. So he, he gets on the Elbe River, and as he's going, this ship, there's a, a huge storm kicks up, and again, he spent a year translating these, the Pentateuch into Hebrew, and the ship goes down, and Tyndale loses everything. Everything. His books, his dictionaries, his study tools, the translation of the Pentateuch, one year completely gone. And it's easy. <laughs> Lawson, who writes this, one of these books, he has a great saying. He's like, just because God opens a door doesn't mean you've got to walk through it. I was like, I don't, this is so, it's such a blessing to hear that. And so as a lot of people would see, oh, this is God closing a door. Like clearly God doesn't want the Old Testament translated. But he's like, no, it's like if, if God, tell, like we're told to make disciples. And so if you have a guy who moves out of state, you're like, well, I'm done. Like God closed the door on disciple making. You're like, no, you just pick up another person and start pouring into them. And so the same way Tyndall's like, whatever. And so he goes back and he spends the next 10 months redoing all the work that he had just done. That's crazy. I went to college, I would have just like failed the class. <laughs> I'm like, whatever. So he is a man possessed, a man on a mission. Ten months retranslating. He writes an introduction to each book. He puts margin notes in the page. He divides the book into literary units, and then he puts glossaries at the end of the Bible. That had never been done. So Tyndale, you could also say he's the father of the first study Bible. Then he goes from there, and this is where he's a man after my own heart. He goes to Jonah. I've preached Jonah. It's somewhere on the line, uh, online, on the line. I love Jonah, and, and Tyndale did as well. He, he was obsessed with it. He was a fastidious translator, but he had the heart in, 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 uh, of a prophet as a pastor. And so in the same way that Nineveh, as Jonah is saying, 40 days in Nineveh to repent, 
Tyndale saw it as 40 days in England to repent. When I give you the word of God, the clock is ticking. And so the darkness of Nineveh, which is modern day Missoula, Iraq, which is like headquarters of ISIS, that darkness, that's very comparable to what, where England was at the time. It's, a, it's the same amount of lostness. And so he, he loved Jonah. He's like, I got to get Jonah into mass quantities so they can see. He, he prayed for a mass repentance in England. And what fueled him is like, this, God did this once in scripture. He's like, this is a real book that actually happened. So he's like, if they read the word of God, preachers start preaching, he's like, I could see a massive coming to the Lord throughout England. So he translates Jonah. In 1534, he goes to Antwerp, which is in Belgium, and he's housed again by some wealthy businessmen. There's a, you kind of see the track here. They have a Bible study, and he can continue to do his translative work in the, in the back office that this guy has, and he retranslates the New Testament, makes some 3,000 edits to his previously work, just, just little like kind of word replacements, not like I'm going to create this whole new Bible, uh, like little jots and tittles that he saw before. He's like, ah, maybe, maybe i got to round this word off. Maybe i got to change this phrasing just to make it more concise. And obviously he's getting feedback from England. And they're like, yeah, like the plow boy, I mean, he doesn't know what scapegoat is. Like you might need a different word. And so that's the sort of translative work that he was doing. He wasn't changing any of the original text. But he was uh, had a meticulous precision in getting it right. He was obsessive perfectionist so much so that in 1611, when hundreds of scholars got together to translate from the Greek and Hebrew, the King James Bible, 90% of that first production was Tyndale. They literally couldn't make it better. That's crazy. Crazy. His work could not be improved upon. In 1535, he upgraded the, Testament, the New Testament one more time, and that's the, that's the Bible that they have up at uh, Master's Seminary, and it's amazing to see. So if you ever go to Shepherd's Conference, or you just take a trip up there, they have all these Bibles throughout history, and Tyndale sticks out like a sore thumb because it's this tiny, shabby, like torn Bible. And I was just like, man, if this thing could talk, it'd be incredible. James, you saw it with us this last time. It just blows your mind that it's still here, you know, some 600 years later. And so um, I'll wrap this up quickly. The downfall happens at this point. He is 1535 was kind of his last produced scripture. Uh, there's a guy in England by the name of Phillips, and he has a son whose name is Harry. And the Phillips is a guy into some debt, and he gives a bunch of money to his son and says, hey, go into town and pay off all my debt. And just like the prodigal son, Harry takes all the money, goes into town, gambles it all, loses the whole thing. So the Catholic Church hears about this, and they know that Harry and his dad, like dad's gonna be upset, and he needs money, and they say, hey Harry, come here. Just like the Pharisees did with Judas. And they're like, you got this gambling debt, we'll, we'll pay you out of the church coffers all of your gambling debts back. We'll use church money to pay off your gambling debts if you go find Tyndale and bring him back here. So he goes, obviously, as anyone would, and he cuts a deal just like Judas. And Tyndale at this time, he's been on the run for 10 years. It's been a decade. So he's like somewhere around 40 years old. It's not really, he's probably actually 40 years old at the time. And Harry gets there and he establishes this relationship with Tyndale. Coming alongside of him, full Judas move. He's like, hey, we're buddies. And the businessmen are all against this dude. They have like high social IQ. And Tyndale has a high IQ, but <laughs> I remiss to call him a nerd. But there's like social IQ and like super good at studying oftentimes don't go together. <laughs> and so Tyndale's like, no, let's think the best. Like, he's a good guy. Like, I want to hang out with him. I can, I can share the gospel with him. He, he loves the work that I'm doing. And these businessmen were like, I don't think so. And so Harry takes him off. Uh, Harry takes him off into an alley. And similar to Judas as they're walking through the garden, Harry walks to Nill around the corner and there's a bunch of soldiers waiting and Harry points at his head and says, that's the man. They attack him, they drag him hand and foot uh, to Belgium. But before that happened, there's a guy by the name of John Rogers who is basically Tyndale's assistant and he hears about the raucous like in the street and runs back into this wealthy businessman's house and just gathers everything that Tyndale had been working on at the time and bails, which is a massive point that I'll touch on later in the text. So Tyndale's taken to, German, or t taken to Belgium. They throw him in uh, the Vilverd Castle. It's a prison. Uh, there's a huge moat around it. The room is dark and damp and cold, and he suffers terrible, terrible sicknesses, illnesses, loneliness, darkness, and he's there for 500 days. 
and one of the only conversations that we have recorded, just like Paul at Second Timothy as he's sitting in the Mamertine prison, what he's asked for, he's like, bring me the parchments and a jacket. And Tyndale says, someone bring me a lamp. My Hebrew dictionary and my Hebrew copy of the Old Testament, let me continue my study. So on the 500th day, there's a, a trial that's basically a mockery of justice. The charges against Tyndale are thus, and every one of you would be charged. The charges, he was charged as a heretic because he believed justification by faith alone in Christ alone. He believed in the bondage of the will by sin, and that was heresy. In, in fact, or, original sin, the, the depravity of man, nothing, no, really no, <laughs> the gospel fueled him, but, but that really fueled him. Because the Catholic Church at the time was like, oh man, um, I don't have enough time, a bunch of quotes from Catholic doctrine were like, man, man naturally desires God. Like, he, he just wants to get there, and then they have like the prevenient grace. But Tyndale's like, I, I don't see that. I'm reading Romans 3, and it says, no one seeks after God. No, no one comes to the Father unless the Father draws him. And so he saw this is a full act of God without the depravity of man and the fallenness of man, then this whole doctrine goes out the window, which is how you can bring in purgatory and all these other things that were made up. Thirdly, you believe that Christians should not pray to saints. Scripture, there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Amen. One means one. Four, declaring that rulers who claim Christ as their king should act like Christ and repent of sin. <laughs> so like up to the last minute, this guy's like, I'm just gonna jab, you know, Henry one more time. And lastly, opposition of papal authority and that the Bible is the only authority, not the Pope. Then they take him through a religious ceremony, a lot like Christ where he, he had the religious flogging and mocking and then they brought him before Pilate uh, Tyndale was the same way. So he goes through a religious ceremony, mocking him just like our Lord. They, they put on his, these priestly garments and they tore the priestly garments and then they take, took his hands and they charred glass in them because as the, as the priest would stand up like this, the people would be able to tell, oh, your, your hands are scraped so we can't listen to you. They then hand him over to the authorities and the government condemns him to death. And this death, they needed to set a standard for people who were doing what Tyndale was doing so on that 500th day, 500th day they uh, tie him to a stake in the public arena. They wrap a chain around his neck and slowly start to strangle him till he dies. And as they're pulling on this chain, Tyndale cries out, just like the Lord saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And First Peter, Christ continued entrusting himself to the Father who judges justly. Just like Stephen, before all those stoning him, Tyndale cries out, God, open the eyes of the king. And then he dies. He knew that for the scripture to get into England, the king would have to be on board. And that was his last cry, his last prayer. So his body limps down after dying. Uh, they put wood around it and burn him. And they pile gunpowder on the fire and blow his body into a million pieces all over. Lawson says this about Tyndale. He was just a trailblazer. He was the trail itself. That was Tyndale. I, I pray that it's you as well. And in 1538, one year later, his prayer was answered because this happens. And it's crazy. If I could take you through the sovereignty of King Henry wanting to get rid of his older wife for his younger wife, and God sovereignly used that to create the Church of England, which then sovereignly puts King Henry in place, which then puts Tyndale and Coveryall the ability to get the Bible into the church, is, is crazy. Like you, you can't write that story. So one year later, his prayer is answered by a, name, a, a man named Coverdale who kind of continues Tyndale's legacy. And remember, Rogers had gathered them all up and, and brought them to England. And those parchments and those things that remained, Coverdale was able to use. And his translation, I would argue, is not as good as Tyndale's. But it's what got Henry VIII to be like, I like this one. And the Henry VIII creates what they call the Great Bible, and that's the big one that you see. Like the big old pulpit Bibles where you're like, this thing is like massive. <clears throat> and what King Henry did was he said, I need every church in England to put one of these on the pulpit. Nay, we need to rope it to the pulpit. So he had them chained to the pulpit. Why? So that the pastor would know I'm coming out of this book. And secondly, so the people wouldn't steal it. That's how bad they wanted the scripture. And also after they preached, the whole congregation would come up and look at the text that was preached. And so imagine one Bible and the whole congregation afterwards, they're just like doing this number. It's incredible. 
So God truly answered this prayer, that the plowboy would know more of the Bible than the Pope in Rome. My, my prayer is, as you sit here today, that you would understand, again, that the Bible is not brought to you in pen and ink, but in blood. It is soaked in blood from the blood of Christ through the blood of the martyrs into your hands. You, be thankful. I mean, I was saved at this church. There was like six people at this church, and God, Matt preached James 1, and I was like, you're the worst. Like, how can you say that to people? Like, joy in all circumstances, it's crazy. And he's like, he came up to me and he said, um, he said, oh, you, you've read the Bible? I said, no. And he said, well, you got a lot of opinions about a book you never read. And I was like, oh, man, like, he knew the, so I spite read the Bible in like two weeks. <laughs> and it changed my life. Like, I'm here right now. Like, I got the book. That's it. And so we need to remember, like, if, if God is, so I was talking to a guy up at Shepherd's Conference, and he was the, he was like a, a, a security guard. And I was like, man, like, you've been at MacArthur's church, like, for what, 30 years? Like, oh, he's like, oh, I just live across the street. I'm like, what? I was like, do you ever think, like, man, God sovereignly plopped you, like, next to this, like, the, possibly the greatest pastor theologian in the last 100 years? He's like, no, I never thought about that. I'm like, what? And so, like, we can easily t- take things like that uh, uh, for granted. And so be thankful that you're at a church that preaches the Bible, that teaches the Bible, that lets you hold the Bible and fact check everything that we're seeing and lets you see for itself. We have an inductive Bible study class. We want you to see the word for yourself, as Tyndale did, to carry on that legacy, to open it, to read it, to love it, to respect it, to hold it in high regard because it is the word of God. This is what the word of God says about the word of God and I can't think of a better way to end it than this. I'll just skip a bunch. The word says, it's a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. It's God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. It's able to sanctify in truth because it is truth. As Psalm 1 says, the man is blessed who delights in the word and meditates on it day and night. Psalm 19, are we the best picture? It says, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. I mean, that, that's Tyndale. He wanted to revive the souls of England. He wanted to make the plowboys and the quote-unquote fools be wise in the scriptures. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord are pure, enlightening the eyes. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold even much fine gold, and sweeter also than honey and the dripping of the honeycomb. That's what Tyndale thought, and that's what he gave his life for, and I pray that you'd be willing to do the same. Let's pray. (coughs) Father, I thank you for the men throughout history, again, who have shed their blood because Christ shed his for theirs. And we in this room as well, Uh, who sit here and benefit by all their labor and hard work, born into arguably the easiest culture in the world. We can be so prone to be apathetic towards the gospel, apathetic towards the scripture. I pray that tonight as we have read these texts and learned about William Tino, that it would fan into flame our desire to be in this book. Continue to sanctify us in truth because your word is truth. May Christ be honored and you be glorified. It's in his name we pray, amen.